He has a clinic and a hospital in Ond. He is a director of MediPoint Hospital. He is a professor of pediatrics at D Y Patil Medical College, Pune. He was also the president of IAP 2016. He was standing committee member International Pediatric Association from 2016 to 2019. He was steering committee member at Gavi CSO from 2016 to 2019. He was the chairman of IAP advisory committee on immunization from 2015 to 17. He has received a Plotkin's prize for best performance in advac at NEC France in 2011. Additionally, he is the senior consultant to UNICEF and also the chief editor Times of Pediatrics. He has delivered innumerable lectures on national and international platforms and has more than 150 articles in reputed journals to his credit. I think it was uh, it is our great honor to have you on our uh, on board, sir, and to uh, we would like Yana. to hear you uh, and uh, over to you, sir. Umar, thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay. I hope everybody is able to see the slides. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, good evening, friends. We are going to discuss about the approach to respiratory infections, and uh, this is not a topic which you have never heard before. You have already heard, but what I am going to do today is to guide you in your day-to-day -day practice because. many times we get children who have cold and cough and fever and some change in the voice and some type of different type of cough and breathlessness and so many symptoms are there in the respiratory system but if we approach these symptoms methodically then we can always come to a conclusion as to what this child is suffering from right from the history itself then we go on to the examination and then we investigate and then we treat the child and as you all know respiratory infections are the bread and butter of our day to day practice because diarrhea has definitely gone down of course because of the wearing of the mask and the social distancing the respiratory infections have also gone down but now as the uh, things are improving and as the schools would reopen respiratory infections are again going to come back and we have to be well prepared academically and that is why this particular talk is for our iap members and i always say that iap stands for intelligence wise average pediatricians this is not for the hip not the highly intelligent pediatricians because they are already knowing all the matter but our average pediatrician must know what is to be done at the ground level okay and this is for members with e iq e stands for enhanced iq okay because of the so many webinars which took place last year everybody has a bit of a more iq now and that's why we will definitely discuss this topic above a little level and if you have any question please do not hesitate to put in the chat box and as everyone knows uh, children experience almost 3 uh, to 8 respiratory infections per year and uh, many times you know parents come and tell me sir ye kya hai aapke paas hum bar bar aate hai fir bhi bacche ko ye bar bar sardi khansi hoti hai ye kya hai so i tell them that see this is because your child has a good immunity and that is why the child is getting fever cough and cold in fact this is not the right answer the right answer is that these are all viral infections many of them are called as back to back viral infections and in case if the child is growing very well then we are not to worry so how to know that the child is growing well simply maintain the growth chart okay we have the blue and the pink growth charts which have been given to us by the indian academy of pediatrics and also some pharma and we have to maintain them so when you give the file at the time of uh, the first visit of the patient in the file itself kindly put the blue or the pink form depending on whether this is a boy or a girl and ask them to see that the doctor enters the weight of the child at every visit and then you can reassure them that though this child is getting repeated respiratory infections his growth is normal and that's why 
you need not worry and these are all viral infections and we will discuss a little bit more about this in the uh, course of this particular talk and as i already told you respiratory infections are the major reasons for the pediatric opd attendance now let us see a child who comes to us with fever cough and either nasal or ear discharge and i always say that ent that is ear nose and throat that is the entrance to the respiratory system okay and that's because we have the pharyngotonsillitis sinusitis and otitis media so he's a one year old male child brought with the history of acute onset of cough with fever and rhinorrhea and this particular child has acute onset the eyes are red there is discharge from the nose there is also diarrhea of course there is no rash but the voice has changed it has become hoarse and the child has a very bad cough and uh, there is mild congestion in the throat and there are similar cases of cough and cold in the family so obviously our learned audience now knows that more than one system is involved in this child and that is why this is viral also other members in the family are also involved and that is a viral pharyngotonsillitis okay and how should one investigate and manage are you going to do the blood count and the throat culture not needed at all and the treatment is general and symptomatic antibiotics are not needed so just give the child rest and oral fluids avoid irritants in case if the father or the grandfather is a smoker ask them not to smoke give analgesics and the antipyretics paracetamol being the drug of choice home remedies like tulsi and ginger or lemon with honey could be given and you can always give good quality soups because children usually love tomato soup or any other soup because they are unwell you know they feel better with some change in the diet and uh, you can always give them zinc or herbal products or vitamin c though they do not have any confirmed role okay and normal saline nasal drops will help children under the age of 2 years who have blocked nose in case if you know this child has a bothersome rhinorrhea you can give antihistamines and if there is a bothersome dry cough you can give dextromethorphan and you tell them that it will take 5 to 7 days to resolve and that's why please explain at this point you must know as to how you differentiate a common cold from allergic rhinitis okay common cold that is viral either rhinovirus or a flu virus the cold will last for about a week while in allergic rhinitis it will last for more than 10 days and as i already told you a child with common cold will have fever constitutional symptoms like body ache headache while these symptoms will be absent in a child who has uh, allergic rhinitis on the other hand allergic rhinitis child will have allergic signs like allergic salute or the child might have nasal itching and uh, in a child who has common cold the nasal mucosa will be red while in allergic rhinitis the nasal mucosa will be pale and as i already told you the response to antihistamines may not be very good in common cold while family members will be definitely affected in a child with common cold and the response to antihistamines will be very good in allergic rhinitis and all the members in the family will not be affected at one time okay now let us see that there is arjun who is a 4 year old child brought to the clinic with two days history of high spiking fever and mild cough at this particular juncture the onset is very acute he doesn't have red eye rhinorrhea or diarrhea he doesn't have exanthem and uh, he has pain and difficulty in swallowing and he is not even able to take liquids easily because it is hurting him the cough is mild and uh, there is no history of similar case in the family so there is bit of a difference in the first and this particular case if you look at his throat he will you know uh, as it is he is looking ill and his vitals are stable and there is no respiratory distress and the right sided tonsil is showing a purulent discharge with inflammation of both the tonsils there is a bilateral tender cervical lymphadenopathy and the ear and the nose are normal and the other systemic examination is normal so a doctor in the vicinity has prescribed antibiotics and the mother wants to know whether she should continue and yes the diagnosis is bacterial pharyngotonsillitis and that's why you have to continue the antibiotics so at this juncture remember there is a scoring system which goes by the name of centaur score and you should know that in a child who has viral problems there won't be any pharyngeal exudates there won't be any cervical lymphadenopathy there won't be any pain while in a child who has bacterial pharyngotonsillitis there will be explosive onset there will be throat pain there will be rapid progression and very little cough and cold and the pharyngeal congestion would be there with thick exudates 
and there will be purulent and patchy tonsils with uh, tender lymph nodes and the child will be toxic. So these are all the probable signs of viral versus bacterial. The points which I have highlighted in red color, they are said to have high negative predictive value. Please try to understand what do I mean? I mean that if a child has no pharyngeal exudate, no cervical lymphadenopathy, no throat pain, then the chances that he does not have bacterial infection are more. And that is called as high negative predictive value. Okay. And remember, majority, 60 to 70% cases of this pharyngotonsillitis are viral. And the commonest virus is, of course, rhinovirus, though there are other viruses. And group A beta hemolytic streptococcus is responsible for 30% of the pharyngotonsillitis. So you will understand that pharyngotonsillitis also in majority of the cases is viral. And that is why you need not give antibiotics almost 70% of the cases. Now, remember that if at all you go ahead and do some throat swab and culture, and if you isolate pneumococcus or that hemophilus influenzae, then remember they are colonizers and they are not pathogens. They always love to stay in the throat okay and that's why if you isolate them remember they are not the pathogens in majority of the cases okay so if you go on to diagnose remember the diagnosis of these conditions is clinical but the accuracy <laughs> of clinical diagnosis <laughs> is about 35 to 50 percent and if, <laughs> like, <laughs> PSR and crp are generally not useful and the aso titer is also not recommended though throat culture is the gold standard for the diagnosis of streptococcal pharyngitis, the negative throat culture result, again, as I told you, has a very high negative predictive value. Remember that. And there are some tests which are called as rapid antigen detection tests. They have a very good specificity that is high positive predictive value, but poor sensitivity. So remember that mostly the diagnosis is clinical. Okay. Now the junior doctor wants to know that you are saying that it is self-limiting on one side within three to four days, it will recover on its own. Then why are you inclined to give antibiotics? The reason is that the antibiotics, they quicken the recovery and they reduce the superiority complications. Okay. And they also reduce the non superiority complications like rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. And remember, even if you give these antibiotics up to ninth day, they are effective. And that is why we treat them with penicillin group of medications okay and you all know that we treat them with either oral penicillin or amoxicillin but you have to treat it for 10 days very important not for three to five days the commonest mistake is that we prescribe one bottle and then you know patients also feel that it's the end of it it's not so okay remember that there are children who come to us with recurrent sore throat and i'm sure many of our colleagues know that uh, this is a very common complaint so there is a five-year-old child comes with recurrent throat infection and uh, he has missed the school five days in a month for almost last one year. And the mother has seen five pediatricians and also seen two ENT surgeons. And right now this child has come with almost seven antibiotic courses so far. And uh, one of the pediatrician in fact has advised weekly azithromycin for three months, though it is not rational. And the ENT surgeon, as you know, they will always advise tonsillectomy. I always remember my teacher used to tell me that the surgeons, they survive because patients have appendix. Uh, the pediatricians, they survive because children do not eat. And ENT surgeons survive because patients have tonsils, isn't it? So the ENT surgeon has advised uh, tonsillectomy. And now the patients are seeking a second opinion from you. Now, remember, this is a very common scenario. And what you have to remember is that you have to look at the throat every time, okay, every time. So the doctor will consider to have viral pharyngitis. Look at this particular throat. This is viral pharyngitis. And remember that there are some more pictures of non-bacterial throat infections that I'm trying to tell you. So on the left side, you can see uh, keratosis. That is a white patch. On the right side, you can see after ulcers. All these, they do not require antibiotics at all. So whenever a child comes to you with recurrent throat infection, you will ask me as to, sir, what do I tell them? See, you have to tell them that allergic problems are first to be ruled out. You have to first do a workup like a CID. You have to find out whether there is upper airway obstruction like adenoids, whether this child has sinus problem. So many things are there. So it is likely 
that the child has underlying allergic problem and that is getting exacerbated and the patients feel that this is recurrent cough and cold in fact it is allergic disorder in case if a child has recurrent viral infection the child will be absolutely all right in between the two episodes okay so try to understand that if the child is absolutely all right then it is more likely to be viral the growth chart will be normal while if it is allergic exacerbation every time then this child particularly will have other problems related to allergic disorders like allergic conjunctivitis atopic eczema somebody in the family might be suffering so all these things are minor things which you must ask them otherwise many of our colleagues will feel ye sardi khasi aur bukhar mein kya hai itna discuss karne jaisa but these are very minor important points which you should know and as i told you there are some criteria where tonsillectomy is advised for example but remember one important thing that up to the age of 5 or 6 years you know these large tonsils are many times seen because they are the lymphoid structures which are as it is going to be seen as enlarged so if there is a recurrent infection with a frequency of at least 7 episodes in the past year or 5 episodes per year for the last 2 years then these are the criteria for tonsillectomy and i already told you that the ent surgeons would be extinct if there are no tonsils that is my way of putting it the full form of ent okay so now remember that the management protocol involves the examination of the eye ear nose and the body and if there is conjunctivitis coryza hoarseness cough then just see whether it is viral and give symptomatic treatment and the child will respond remember hoarseness of voice or change of voice is an important indicator of viral infection in case if there is a purulent discharge or patch or the child is toxic and the lymph nodes are tender then it is bacterial and then you have to just observe this child and uh, follow up this child okay we will now proceed further to find out whether we can know the enemy okay so many viruses are there you will ask me is it possible to find out what is this virus so if the onset is with cold and sneezing then the most common is of course the rhinovirus where there will be cold upper airway involvement will be there and there will be either mild or no fever the child will not be exhausted and will play well but in case if along with fever there is prominent headache myalgia extreme exhaustion then this is more likely to be flu if it's a adenovirus then we get what is called as a pharyngo conjunctival fever along with that you will get diarrhea mesenteric lymphadenitis and hemorrhagic cystitis adenovirus is a different virus and in a child who is less than 1 year if there is bronchiolitis then you should suspect respiratory syncytial virus if there is fever and dry cough then these days we always suspect covid 19 and some other enemies which are bacteria like you know those who come with fever and follicular tonsillitis with tender cervical nodes we already saw that it is streptococcus if there is fever with grunting and tachypnea it is going to be pneumococcus which we will see in the latter part of the lecture and if it is a rapid progression and the child is toxic it is staphylococcus and if it is a child who has more than 4 years having predominantly cough more symptoms than signs then it is mycoplasma this is a rough guide for all of you to find out whether you can detect some organism because many times our treatment is going to be an educated guess it is a guess work when you give an antibiotic ultimately you are guessing because every time we are not going to do all those investigations so but the guess has to be an educated guess okay so now this is sonu a 5 year old child suffering from viral pharyngotonsillitis 10 days back he improved and now returned with fever and headache now see there is purulent nasal discharge also there is periorbital edema with tenderness on percussion on the maxillary sinuses look at him and there is purulent rhinorrhea he is toxic is this sinusitis yes it is likely to be sinusitis and now we have to see as to how to take the decision and how to select the antibiotics and when to refer to the ent surgeon so remember that the organisms in this upper respiratory tract the bacteria particularly they are pneumococcus h influenzae and moraxella these three will always appear but remember that we have started giving h influenzae vaccine in the form of pentavalent many of us have also started giving pneumococcal vaccine which covers streptococcus pneumonia and that's why the incidence of these two organisms is going down and that is why the bacteriology of these infections is changing and it is we pediatricians who are going to now record as to what is the likely organism however for the sake of discussion today 
we are going to consider these three as the common organisms. And whenever there is a thick mucopurulent discharge and a post nasal drip, see in allergic rhinitis, the discharge is from anterior part, that is anterior rhinorrhea. While in sinusitis, it is posterior, okay? And it is persistent for 10 to 14 days. There is fever, headache, and facial pain. And the cough is in lying down position. And this child will need antibiotic therapy for almost 14 days. Very important. The commonest mistake is that people bring the bottle only for, you know, three to four days, and then they stop medication. It is our duty to inform them that this is sinusitis, and the treatment has to be for 14 days if it is bacterial sinusitis. However, underlying allergy also should be kept at the back of mind, okay? Now, these children with sinusitis, the commonest presentation is that onset is with viral upper respiratory infection, which lasts for five to six days, but it persists. It doesn't disappear, okay? It doesn't improve. And then this particular child is the one who gets rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, low-grade fever, which continues. He's irritable. He has headache. He has facial pain, anosmia, and then pharyngitis. All these, this is the most common presentation of sinusitis. There are children who present acutely, okay? But that is not a common presentation. And some children, they, uh, you know, will continue to be uh, ill for a long time. And they are the ones who form the third category. What you should remember is that whenever a child comes with acute presentation, the organism is likely to be pneumococcus and he is likely to respond very well to amoxicillin. But if he continues to come to you with uh, cold and, uh, you know, cough and fever and going on for five, six days, seven days, the more indolent or slowly growing progression, that is more likely to be the non-typeable hemophilus influenzae, which we say, which responds well to the clavulinic acid along with amoxicillin. So the drug of choice for treatment of acute onset sinusitis, which I told you is not very common, is amoxicillin. However, for the other category, it is amoxiclav. Of course, you should remember that the first line drug for majority of the respiratory infections is amoxicillin and amoxiclav comes as the second line drug. Okay. And remember one important thing. If a child is under the age of five years, do not subject this child unnecessarily to the x-rays of the sinuses. The sinuses are not well developed under the age of five to six years. The frontal sinus develops, in fact, starts developing at seven or eight years, okay, and gets fully developed in the early teens, okay? So remember that uh, many of our colleagues unnecessarily send parents along with children for the x-ray of the sinuses. Please, please avoid that. You can simply remember this point that the sinuses start developing later. So in a child under the age of four, there is no point in sending these children for x-rays. You will ask me as to then, uh, how do you go ahead and how to diagnose sinusitis? Remember, sinusitis is a clinical diagnosis. I already told you the organisms. But remember, the category that I told you, which was chronic sinusitis, here, you must not forget the anaerobes as the cause of sinusitis, okay? Otherwise, the pathogens, as I already told you, streptococcus pneumoniae, non-typable H. influenzae, and moraxella. They are the commonest, producing almost all the infections of the sinuses as well as the middle ear. And if you want to diagnose, as I told you, it is essentially clinical, and there is uh, only, uh, you know, uh, there is no role of microbiology to a major extent. Again, the treatment I already uh, told you, and uh, in case, if uh, you treat for 10 to 14 days or one week beyond the resolution, whichever is later, usually children would respond. But in case of persistent non-response, then you go for imaging and sinus endoscopy and sinus aspiration. Okay. Now there is another child who is a chap who has uh, been brought by the mother for discharge from both the years. Now see the age is two months. And at this age, if the child is otherwise playful and taking mother's milk nicely and growing well, then remember that the vernix which gets impacted in the external ear many times is the cause of discharge. And I'm sure our colleagues know about it. Now, let us see another child who is Karna. Now, some of the names are related to the organ to which I am referring. So, Karna means the ear. So, Karna is a 15-month otherwise healthy boy with rhinorrhea, cough and fever of 102 degrees for two days. And on day five, he became fussy and woke up crying multiple times at night, okay? So he might have acute otitis media. Very common history. They will get up frequently at night. Mother will say, sota hai aur utta hai. Sota hai, wapas utta hai. Very common. 
acute otitis media and how to evaluate first is do the clinical examination ent evaluation and otoscopy remember otoscope is extremely important all these years we survived only with stethoscope but now two other things in the respiratory system one is the otoscope and other is the pulse oximeter which we must have on the table or in our visit bag okay and preferably the pneumatic otoscope so tomorrow if a representative asks you sir what can i do for you please ask him to get a nice pneumatic otoscope and start using it my teacher used to tell me that pramod you must examine twice the number of years as the number of patients coming to the opd so if 50 patients come to my opd then i have to examine 100 ear drums it is obvious because one person has two ear drums so you must start doing it and the best way to learn otoscopy is to start doing it on each and every patient even if he comes to you for gastroenteritis start doing otoscopy so that you will yourself learn okay now the findings are that the child had wax in the ear and the ear drum could not be visualized this becomes a very common finding what could you do you can attempt to remove the wax only if it is soft with the help of a curet or otherwise you can put a solvent and then remove that and uh, remember if a child is crying because of the wax and it is impacted then that particular procedure could be very painful and that's why whenever a child comes to you crying crying and crying and if the child has wax and if you suspect uh, otitis media at this moment you are justified in giving empirical therapy because if you try to remove the wax just to see the tympanic membrane it will be extremely painful okay and that's why please remember this point and uh, this is the uh, picture of the ear drum and uh, the one on the left side where you can find there is slight redness on the you know tympanic membrane and no fluid and you can see the one on the right side where there is bulging and has loss of the details and the pneumatic otoscopy is extremely important wherein you can see the position whether it is retracted or bulging you can see the color you can see the opacity whether the landmarks are clear or not and the mobility whether it is freely mobile or restricted remember you might find that this is something which is uh, not our usual practice but remember this is important okay and remember that the signs of acute otitis media on otoscopy include erythema fluid impaired mobility and acute symptoms and the next step is to define the severity okay so severe otitis media severe symptoms okay and uh, you know this particular child will be toxic with high fever of 102 degrees and uh, non severe otitis media will have intermittent pain and there will be response to analgesics and there would be mild or no fever so this is definition of severity all these things are extremely important because when you manage you have to give analgesia with the help of paracetamol in adequate doses and uh, local analgesic drops may help and the systemic antibiotics in divided doses for 10 days remember again not 3 or 4 days okay again for non severe acute otitis media it is amoxicillin just as a rule just remember that whenever a child is brought to you if the child is under the age of 6 uh, months less than 6 months usually this child is to be treated with antibiotics but the management of acute otitis media if the child is about 2 years then you have to simply give analgesics decongestants maybe and when you come across such a child who is about 2 years there is something called as deferred prescription what is deferred prescription this is a child where there is no urgency to start antibiotics okay because about the age of 2 years you can wait and watch and that's why put a line and under that you write down after 40 to 72 hours if the fever doesn't subside if irritability doesn't go down please start on amoxicillin 40 mg per kg per day in 2 to 3 divided doses for 7 days this is for acute otitis media about 2 years but i told you if a child is less than 6 months you are justified in giving antibiotic and in between 6 months and 2 years i will just tell you what is the plan of action here again if the child is sick you can always give him the antibiotics if the child is not sick you can wait for some time and remember to continue the antibiotics for 10 days and if the patient deteriorates then you can consider change of antibiotics to coamexiclav or injectable ceftriaxone okay the choices are different but never use cefixim because it has poor action against 
pathogens like pneumococcus. So please, please do not prescribe cefixim in a child who has otitis media. Okay. Now he has improved completely, but he has come for a routine follow-up and he doesn't have signs of inflammation, but there is dullness and bulging of the tympanic membrane in both the ears. And the diagnosis is middle ear effusion, which is a common complication following acute otitis media. And the 10th day pneumatic otoscopy is prudent and it should be mandatory. Please remember this. We have not been doing all this all these days, but the days are there that you must do all this. And this is the one that I wanted to tell you that uh, the treatment is not no acute treatment and mostly it resolves by 12 weeks. Remember this. And in case if there is a child who comes to you with recurrent otitis media, remember recurrent means he comes very often for this otitis media. The problem could be either with the child, he might be immunodeficient or the child could be uh, bottle fed or there could be someone in the family who is a smoker or maybe, you know, there is a biofilm in the middle ear. There are various factors as to why a child gets recurrent otitis media. Okay. One of my friends always uh, used to tell me that in case of otitis media, never assume anything. A child with irritability and uh, excessive crying, immediately don't call it otitis media because when you mm -hmm. assume, you, he used to tell me that you make ass of you and me. Okay. And remember another thing, there is a lot of scope for otoscope. So from tomorrow, please, please start mm -hmm. using an otoscope. Okay. There is another group of children which comes to us and that is croup. That is, you know, a child who has all these problems along with noisy breathing. Okay. And remember, the characteristics of this are that the onset is acute. There is fever, runny nose and cough. And uh, there is change in the character of the cough. And it is like to be involving the larynx. And that is why the acute upper airway infection with laryngitis. What you should remember is that you have to first diagnose that it is croup. And the most important thing is you have to remember the triad of croup. The triad is change of voice, barking cough. Okay. Change of voice, barking cough and inspiratory stridor. Something like this. That means the child, when he takes the breath, he will produce a sound like. Ah, ah. So you can diagnose it even from a distance when the child is sitting in the OPD. And he will have a barking cough, like oh, oh, you know, as if a dog is barking. Okay. So remember when there is a triad of the change of voice along with stridor and barking cough, it is and uh, almost always it is viral. Majority of them are because of the para influenza virus. But the child is very playful. He will eat well and he won't have any similar episode in the past. And, uh, you know, when you look at the nose, there will be. Uh, rhinitis and the ear and the throat will be uh, normal. This is acute viral croup and there is a particular grading of this. When the child is feeding well, he is interested in the surrounding and there is no stridor, no distress, okay? Only change of voice and the saturation is normal. It is mild croup. In case if the child, is, if the child is getting stridor at rest, and worsens after agitation, that means when the child is excessively active, then it is moderate degree. Again, here the saturation is more than 92%. But if the child is restless or agitated and he has altered sensorium and he has tried or at rest and the saturation is less than 92%, then it is severe crew. Okay. Very important to remember. So this child who came to us had mild crew. And that's why we will just give him symptomatic treatment with antibiotics, antihistaminics, normal saline nasal drops. And in case maybe you can use single oral dose of prednisolone in the dose of 2 mg per kg or dexamethasone or a single nebulized dose of budesonide. Okay. Patients are to be informed because many times they come to us with mild croup, but Generally, these problems, they may get severe at night and ask the parents to look out for increasing stridor, increasing breathing difficulty and the child getting increasingly agitated, refusing the feeds and ask them to come back for medical assistance. And the mother of this chap calls you at night and says that, uh, uh, you know, uh, breathing severity has increased and uh, she is bringing to the emergency. Now here you check this child. He has saturation of 92 percent. 
and he has minimal intercostal retraction and has good air entry bilaterally. Now, do we need to do anything for this child? Remember that there are X-rays of the soft tissue of the ah. neck which are done, and they reveal tapering or narrowing. That is a steeple sign of the subglottic trachea of the normal shoulder appearance. Normal appearance is disturbed. However, this should be done only if there is poor response to treatment. And when do you do the X-ray? I will tell you about retropharyngeal abscess, which is one more condition. So now this particular child has gone from mild to moderate. And that is why, remember, the steroids are given for moderate or the severe category. Nebulized adrenaline is given and oxygen is not required for the moderate category. But for the severe category, it is required to keep the saturation above 92%. Remember, antibiotics have no role in this condition. You make this child sit in the OPD for four hours and uh, you can observe him during the daytime. And if at all steroids have not been given, you can give them a dose of oral or intramuscular steroid. The efficacy of both is equal and you can give nebulized adrenaline. It uh, helps by reducing the edema. And uh, remember, the nebulized budesonide is also recommended for mild disease. Dexamethasone, as I told you, oral or intramuscular efficacy is equal and oral corticosteroids are preferred for their ease. And adrenaline is used in severe cases, particularly and those poorly responding to steroids. They have to be given in the nebulized form. And at the end of two hours, the Arshan, you know, is still unwell and non-consolable. The saturations are dropping in the room air and requiring oxygen by nasal cannula. Now, how one should treat? You continue oxygen, but here you must admit this particular child. Steroids need to be continued. And if airway obstruction or the work of breathing is worsening, one should consider intubation. Okay. Now, remember that there is a definite protocol of treating viral croup, which I already explained. So try to first classify into mild, moderate, and severe. And accordingly, you manage this particular child. And remember, antibiotics have no role. Now, there is another Preeti. Preeti, two-year-old, has persistent cough. She has been coughing for the last two weeks and has low-grade fever and has severe bouts of coughing. And she is the one who has a problem, which is pertussis. Another girl, Tulsi. Preeti and Tulsi, because this is pertussis, so I have taken the names nearer to them. Now, Tulsi also has severe paroxysm during the day, some of which are followed by vomiting. And there is no reduction in the severity of the paroxysms. And remember, whenever there is a partially long cough, and when there is no specific cause, and there is whoop, and after the cough, the child is vomiting, remember, you have to always, always think of pertussis. When pertussis affects the neonates, there is apnea and you have to diagnose that, okay? The paroxysmal cough is seen even in partially immune individuals, okay? Also remember, the typical paroxysm is only to be heard to be understood, okay? It's a series of rapid forced expirations followed by gasping inhalation and the child becomes really cyanosed with bulging eyes, protrusion of the tongue, salivation, lacrimation and distension of the neck veins and it is triggered by yawning or sneezing or physical exertion. Please remember there is leukocytosis with lymphocytosis. Chest x-ray is not sensitive or specific. PCR is more sensitive than cultures and serology is not recommended. But again, the diagnosis is clinical and it is helped by the complete blood count. Okay. And remember the treatment with antibiotics will only reduce the transmissibility. It may reduce the symptoms if they are given in the first week. But by the time the child comes to you, many times, you know, it is little late. And azithromycin is the drug of choice considering all the factors. Now, there is another girl who is Deepti, who has come to us. She is also unimmunized, but has difficult noisy breathing for two days. And she has mild to moderate yet fever, is lethargic. And on examination, she has noisy breathing, diffuse swelling of the neck. And there is a grayish white membrane over the pharyngotonsillar area, which bleeds on touch and is difficult to remove. And remember, this is obviously the bull neck or the diffuse swelling of the neck. And probably she has diphtheria. 
you can see other pictures of this particular condition and you should suspect diphtheria particularly if there is sore throat with a membrane fever hoarseness barking cough stridor and there is a zero sanguinous nasal discharge and in case if it is late then it may present with complications like parietal palsy myocarditis or acute polyneuropathy this may occur even in previously immunized but remember immunization gives good amount of protection okay and you have to confirm it with the help of culture of the membrane and scraping below the membrane okay hospitalization is required in case uh, if the this particular child uh, is serious and the droplet isolation till three consecutive daily cultures are negative just remember the components of therapy include diphtheria antitoxin which is most crucial along with penicillin group of drugs along with supportive care there are some conditions like retropharyngeal abscess or pharyn body or epiglottitis or bacterial tracheitis which will come to us with fever and change in the character of cough and stridor one condition that is retropharyngeal abscess remember the neck will be flexed and there will be noisy breathing and please please remember whenever there is drooling of saliva the child is toxic you have to always always think of this particular condition and there is another group of children who comes to us with fever and rapid and difficult breathing and they are the ones who have either bronchiolitis or pneumonia now let us see the example of a twin uh, you know a group of babies lav and kush they are three month old twins who are born at the age of 34 weeks and uh, the first one was oxygen dependent for four days after birth and the other one required ventilation and after day 16 he was off oxygen they were brought to the clinic with four days history of fever cold and cough now remember both these chaps they have a problem of bronchiolitis okay and the features at the child will be young well looking also the illness will start with upper airway catarrh there will be tachypnea there will be tachycardia there will be normal saturations the child will be mildly febrile there will be bilateral scattered wheeze and the diagnosis is bronchiolitis please remember the severity again is into mild moderate and severe here the criteria which are used are related to the feeding ability the respiratory distress and saturations remember bronchiolitis is a viral disease antibiotics are not required if the child is having normal ability to feed and no distress and the saturations are above 92 it is mild and if the child is not feeding well and if there is severe distress and the saturations are less than 92 it's severe type of bronchiolitis we all are very well versed with this particular entity and for mild variety we need not treat children we have to simply assure the mother and in case if the child has severe problem we have to admit and give oxygen iv fluids and trial of adrenaline and treatment depending on the progress of this particular child now whenever the second child which i told you who has a problem where there is in season cry dry cough suprasternal and subcostal indrawing and hyperinflated chest and liver and spleen just palpable then he is graded as with moderate severity whenever you come across such children we have seen on many occasions we have seen that children come early in the morning i remember a child who came in the morning everybody thought it is bronchiolitis and it turned out to be vsd ventricular septal defect in failure and the child who was brought with the diagnosis of bronchiolitis but the grandmother said that the child was sitting with her and suddenly while uh, peeling off the groundnuts probably he had put the groundnut which was aspirated so it was a foreign body so many times we have different diagnosis and for uh, severe variety as i told you you have to admit the child and give oxygen iv fluids and possible treatment now remember there are certain factors with increased severity of bronchiolitis and these are particularly children in the day care those who are exposed to a passive smoke those who are born prematurely and those who have some heart disease or chronic lung disease and in case if a infant is less than 3 months or if the oxygen saturation is less than 92 or if the respiratory rate is very high and the child is looking ill then you have to remember these are the risk factors for hospitalization the diagnosis is essentially clinical and the x ray is required only to rule out pneumonia in case if the diagnosis is not certain then only go ahead with an x ray of the chest and the x ray of the chest will reveal bilateral hyperinflation in a child with bronchiolitis 
Now, many times the residents get confused as to what is the role of various modes of therapy. So remember that the mainstay of therapy is oxygen and IV fluids and management of fever. I always used to tell my resident that the management is H2O. What is H2? One is human milk, second is hydration and O is oxygen. Beyond hydration and oxygen, there is no change in the treatment for the last 40 years. The first edition of Nelson also mentioned this and the recent edition also mentions this. And hypertonic saline, adrenaline nebulizations and bronchodilators have a questionable role, though they are used by different authorities and there are different research papers. And remember, ABC have no role. What is that ABC? That is the antibiotic. Bronchodilators, as I told you, have a questionable role and the antivirals we will not be discussing because there is no sufficient data. Okay. Now, as regards oxygen, remember, aim to maintain the saturation above 92%. Okay. And uh, there is no role of routine bronchodilators. But if an older infant with wheeze is there with history of atopy, then further therapy will be continued if there is objective improvement. Okay. And remember, uh, there is little support from the randomized clinical trials uh, for adrenaline in the use uh, as in the nebulized form. However, the volume for nebulization is 3 to 5 ml and you can use it 0.1 to 0.3 ml per kg, diluting it to make a minimum volume of 3 to 5 ml. Okay, And there is always a discussion of a hypertonic saline that is 3% to 7% with its different mechanisms of action and it reduces the clinical severity scores, duration, and the rate of hospitalization. Please remember, corticosteroids, no role, and the respiratory syncytial virus is the most common cause, but the specific antiviral therapy has been of limited value. Also remember that uh, the randomized controlled trials have failed to demonstrate any benefit in the hospitalized infants with bronchiolitis. The only role for antibiotics is complicated bronchiolitis, where secondary bacterial infection is suspected. Remember, at this juncture, let me clarify that the term secondary bacterial infections is used by many people as an excuse to start antibiotics. Plus, please remember that it is extremely rare, whether it is throat, whether it is, uh, you know, lungs, this is something which is uncommon, and you should not use it as an excuse for starting antibiotics, okay? Now, when the child is accepting orally well, and uh, he has received oxygen, uh, for a long time and for 10 hours he doesn't receive supplemental oxygen he doesn't need it and there are no retractions you can always send this chap home and now this child has come to us with acute history of fever and cough with uh, irritability with significant cough and the practitioner has told that the girl has pneumonia and now you have to uh, just see whether it is pneumonia and this is our classical way of putting pneumonia in front if a child under the age of two months has a rate of 60 or more, a child between two months to 12 months with a rate of 50 or more, and a child with 12 months to five years with a rate of 40 or more, then we usually think of pneumonia. However, remember, these are the cutoffs for the community level in children less than five years. This is not something as the pakka final diagnosis of pneumonia, because there are many other things to diagnosis. And also remember that uh, the 60, 50, and 40, these are the ones which are the cutoffs given for the community level. However, there are non-respiratory causes, also causes like the bronchiolitis, asthma, wheeze associated, low respiratory infections. And that's why this respiratory rate is only a beginning step. That is what we call as a triad sign. You classify, okay? And then use all your clinical skills when you come to a final conclusion. And remember, bronchiolitis to be considered if it is the first episode, age group of one month to two years, presence of upper respiratory catar, and progressive increase in the respiratory distress with wheeze and clinical and radiological evidence of hyperinflation. If it is bronchiolitis, it, what we saw. Consider wheeze associated lower respiratory infection. If there is recurrent episode distress under three years, along with upper respiratory catar, progressive increase in the distress and clinical and radiological evidence of hyperinflation and no family or personal history of atopy. You can consider asthma if it is a recurrent episode, a febrile episode with wheeze with a good response to bronchodilator and laryngotracheobronchitis. We already discussed, particularly if there is hoarseness of voice, 
barking cough and stridor okay so these are the ways you have to differentiate and the respiratory rate alone may help you to some extent but then you have to use your expertise and it may be difficult to differentiate viral pneumonias from bacterial pneumonias let us see something about the community acquired pneumonia this is the pneumonia which occurs in a healthy child outside the hospital setting the one that we get in the first 48 hours in the hospital is called as hospital acquired pneumonia and here remember that uh, there are simple clinical tools which can be used to diagnose pneumonia but in case if you want to diagnose x-ray chest is not required in all the patients okay particularly if on the domiciliary home treatment the x-ray is not required if the child is severely ill or if the complications are suspected or if the clinical features are ambiguous then you can go ahead and get the x-ray okay remember that investigations many times do not give a lot they will take a long time the sputum culture and the cough swabs have relatively poor reliability the blood culture also has a variable yield between 10 to 30 percent in different centers and that is why these are not recommended routinely but remember the pulse oximetry is extremely important to monitor the response uh, to treatment and assess the uh, severity and uh, there are uh, some support evidences for probable etiology for example if a child is under the age of three months usually the uh, gram negative organisms are the causative agents between three to five three months to five years it is the streptococcus pneumoniae and h influenzae i already told you that staph is the one which infects children under the age of two years younger the infant suspect staph okay and because of immunization streptococcus pneumoniae and h influenzae are now slowly going down beyond five years you can think of pneumococcus along with mycoplasma pneumoniae these are all guidelines for you okay and remember that uh, the uh, some of these investigations now particularly related to the x-ray the staphylococcus particularly is to be suspected if there is a rapid progression with skin lesions there is infection in the scabetic lesions and if a child has effusion or pneumothorax or empyema or if there has been a recent history of measles now some of these factors will guide you to the diagnosis of staphylococcus and on detailed examination this child has tachypnea no cyanosis or diaphoresis she is conscious but irritable she has significant lower chest retraction and flaring of the alinezae and when you look at these the classification of pneumonia given by who is very simple it is pneumonia and severe pneumonia so if there is tachypnea with accessory muscles in action and lower chest in drawing that is pneumonia but if there are additional features like altered sensorium grunting or intermittent apnea or difficulty in feeding it is severe pneumonia very simple and that is why the indications for hospital admission are saturations less than 92 percent bar tachypnea okay that is about 20 breaths per minute above the cutoff difficulty in breathing intermittent apnea or grunting not feeding dehydrated and uh, failure of the opd treatment and how we classify is pneumonia severe pneumonia and suspected staphylococcal disease a simple guide to management if a child is to be treated at home remember under the age of three months never treat anything at home all these children have to be admitted between three months and five years you can use amoxicillin as the first line drug for uh, children uh, as the first line the second line drug is coamoxiclav and for suspected staph you can use continue amoxicillin plus cloxacillin or ceforoxime and uh, for a child who is having five year age the first line treatment is amoxicillin and the second line treatment is coamoxiclav or macrolide in most of these guidelines we will find the domiciliary treatment and the second line treatment uh, particularly uh, will be giving you the basic drug for example in a child who is uh, up to the age of three months you can use the cefotaxime ceftriaxone along with aminoglycosides for the child who is hospitalized the second line treatment will be coamoxiclav and uh, the staphylococcal suspicion cloxacillin usually we use cloxacillin for the treatment of staphylococcus likewise we have the treatment of pneumonias either domiciliary or in the hospital at different settings for the different age groups just remember that particularly when do we use macrolides they are 
used for all cases of pneumonia in children above the age of five years, and the treatment of proven mycoplasma pneumonia with macrolides may not lead to clinically significant benefit, although it is recommended by many. However, routine addition of macrolides to children with community acquired pneumonia does not improve the outcome. That is the uh, you know uh, opinion of a few experts. Okay. However. If there is community acquired pneumonia with extra pulmonary manifestations like myocarditis, hemolytic anemias, arthritis, or aseptic meningitis or encephalitis, you are justified in giving macrolides. Also, for children with prolonged low grade fever, cough, which is not improving, you can use macrolides. Now, remember, staphylococcus is something which you cannot forget because many times, once we start the treatment, with septriaxone and after 48 hours if the child doesn't improve we many times fail to detect the worsening of the child fast that is why at the end of 48 hours if the child is not improving please please remember to go for a ct of the chest on many occasions after the x-ray chest you have to go for hrct because earlier you treat a child earlier you can resort to the modalities uh, and you can always go on for vats or use of streptokinase, but early is the most important uh, thing which you have to remember. And there is supportive management with uh, antipyretics, IV fluids, oxygen. And remember the duration of treatment for the domiciliary treatment is five to seven days. And if he is admitted, then again, you have to treat it for five to seven days. And uh, for staphylococcal disease, if in case uh, there is no complication, you treat it for two weeks, otherwise for four to six weeks. If the child becomes serious, obviously you have to transfer it to a higher center. If the child is unable to maintain the saturation or gets cyanosed or goes into shock. Okay. Now, just remember that empyema, lung abscess, pneumothorax, and bronchiectasis are the complications. And in a child who comes to us and doesn't improve, as I told you earlier, you have to think of a complication or a progression because of non-response or phlebitis or co-infection, okay? And these are the children, in case if they have history of pyoderma or measles, please, please resort to plural tap and check it as a part of routine or a gram stain or a culture, blood culture and sonography. And you get more than 90% polys or 10% lymphos with proteins 4.9, sugar of 25, then you will suspect empyema. Okay. However, if there is presence of pus or microorganisms in the pleural fluid and you have common bugs like streptococcus, staphylococcus, H. influenzae, group A streptococcus or Klebsiella, you must remember uh, to diagnose it as empyema. You have already been told about various investigations to be done and the treatment includes coamoxiclav or cloxacillin, which of course will be altered after the cultures are available. Second line drugs are vancomycin, ticoplanin, or linezolid, along with the third generation cephalosporins. Okay. So, my dear friends, remember certain important take home messages. The viral infections and the non infectious causes of cough do not need antibiotic therapy. Few situations for empirical use of antibiotics. The unwarranted use does not prevent a subsequent secondary infection in most of the situations. First line antibiotics are still effective and the drug of choice. Newer third or the fourth generation antibiotics should be reserved for few non-responders. And all the non-responders are not due to resistant bug. Other causes are also important. If a child presents with fever, cough, with nasal or ear discharge, remember majority are due to viral infections. Antibiotics do not prevent secondary bacterial infections. This throat swab or or the rapid antigen diagnostic test in acute tonsillopharyngitis if there are exudates on the tonsillar surface, cervical node enlargement, absence of conjunctival congestion or symptoms persist for more than three days. Consider sinusitis if the upper respiratory infection persists beyond seven to ten days. Do otoscopy in all the upper respiratory infections to diagnose otitis media. Antibiotics are to be given in group A beta hemolytic streptococcus pharyngitis or sinusitis, severe otitis media, and red and bulging tympanic membrane. And use the first line antibiotics first. Amoxicillin, usual dose, 40 mg per kg, is still effective. In a child with fever, cough, and noisy breathing, 
common conditions are adenoidal hypertrophy croup pertussis and diphtheria croup as i told you is because of viruses no antibiotics required single dose of systemic steroids with epinephrine if required diphtheria isolate start penicillin give anti diphtheritic serum and give immunization on follow up and for pertussis use macrolides and children with breathing difficulty remember bronchiolitis is a viral infection oxygen inhalation iv fluids and adrenaline trial is required and for pneumonia assess clinically there is no need for x ray test in every child amoxicillin is a drug of choice for ambulatory treatment and for admitted children you have to use ampicillin or clonazepam which now is being replaced by a typical organism and under the age of 3 months please use third generation cephalosporin with amine glycoside for empyema use cloxacillin with ceftriaxone or coamoxiclav okay so with that we come to the end of the discussion on approach to the respiratory tract infection we have taken it in the form of symptoms and that is why in case uh, if you have any difficulty please feel free to put on the chat box uh, there have been a uh, lot many uh, you know points which we have covered and uh, it's a, a big topic to be covered in one session however once you get the overview as i said you will be able to think more and more rationally and uh, you will be able to treat the children in a better way i will let you know my email id through micro labs so that in case if you have any difficulty you can feel free uh, to uh, ask the uh, questions one of the questions here is as to how frequently the antibiotic induced diarrhea interferes with treatment and we need to change the therapy this is what dr surinder gupta from dudhiana wants to know remember if the treatment is given for a short period of 5 to 7 days usually we can tide over the problem of 5 to 7 days however in case if the problem is worse the child does not improve if there is empyema if we have to treat for 2 weeks and 3 weeks then the question of uh, antibiotic associated diarrhea or clostridium difficile because all of us know that longer the treatment in psu more are the chances of these problems and for a short period usually problems do not come up there are various observations by various experts about oral use iv use of antibiotics and the association of antibiotic associated diarrhea however i don't think you should worry about the antibiotic associated diarrhea because the priority in the treatment of pneumonia is basically to treat the pneumonia and remember the problem in treating pneumonia is not the infection treatment it is the hypoxia always remember whenever a child has pneumonia the most important thing is prevention of hypoxia because the children won't die of infection they will die of hypoxia and that is why you have seen in croup you have seen in bronchiolitis you have seen in pneumonia that saturations less than 92 they are dangerous so we are more worried and that is why a child who is irritable now remember whenever a child comes to you and mother says the child is crying continuously and purging on one side that is dehydration you give liters of sedatives child will not be quietened the child has cough 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 with fever grunting pneumonia and the child is crying never give sedatives because this child is because of crying because of hypoxia and remember oxygen is the only treatment for uh, treating hypoxia and no amount of sedatives will be of any use so remember you have to know the priority as to what you are doing so after listening to this entire talk now i will like you to go back refer to your uh, own uh, patients when you come across in the practice also refer to some standard textbooks and keep revising you will get refreshing knowledge because because of the covid the bacteriology has changed because of vaccination the bacteriology is changing and that is why you have to now find own ways try to find out the cause of this particular infection try to find out the microbe which is responsible for infection and find out and note down your own judgments one of our colleagues uh, dr surinder gupta wants to know uh, as to the dose of adrenaline in croup and bronchiolitis i already referred to in my talk remember adrenaline mind you okay uh, i think most of the uh, 
questions are already answered uh, and particular talk and also uh, someone wants to know the role of antihistamine in common cold and whether we can use pseudoephedrine for rhinorrhea uh, my dear uh, dr ajay uh, remember that antihistamines particularly the second generation antihistamine ones which you should use because the first generation antihistamines they will produce sedation and sedation is something which we want to use as a parameter for diagnosis of involvement of cns we won't like a child with respiratory distress to be sedated i just told you second generation is antihistamines to a great extent they are non sedating and that is why we always prefer second generation antihistamines like levocetirizine fexofenadine bilastin all these molecules they have sedation as compared to first generation like a uh, chlorpheniramine or hydroxyzine and others and that is why even though the child sleeps well we want to use his awake his wakefulness as a parameter for response to therapy and that is why remember that in case if the child has a runny nose let it flow off if it is too much troublesome then only go ahead and give antihistamines that's why in my presentation i told you that if the common cold is unbearable if the cough is unbearable then only use antihistamines okay with that uh, i thank you for a patient listening uh, and uh, there are some questions about antihistamines like cetirizine and uh, dr rakesh i will be answering some of these questions in one of our next talks which is exclusively for allergic disorders in children and it will be in the uh, next uh, uh, you know session uh, in the same series so maybe i will be able to answer some of these questions at that particular moment so with that i hand over the proceedings and uh, uh, ask the organizers to take over the further proceedings thank you uh, thank you so much sir i think every uh, each and every participant all the doctors would agree on the thought that it was a really a lucid crystal clear and wonderful session and uh, enlightening session uh, thank you so much and it's a great honor to have you uh, here on board sir uh and thank you all the doctors who have joined us today on uh, ecm with our international speaker dr pramod jog on approach to respiratory infection i'm sure everybody uh, have taken so many insights from this session uh, i would like to again inform you that we will be having next series of uh, our ecm with our today's international speaker dr pramod jog on 27th of february on allergic rhinitis and its management so once again thank you so much all of you uh, all of you have joined you have taken your time and you have joined here thank you so much uh, all the doctors present who are and uh, take care stay healthy be safe thank you thank you sir